Now, partita. Now we must uh, be less, a little bit less rigorous. Okay, why? Because we need to tell what is a motion close to equilibrium. What we are doing for this? I call Q of T the motion and I say that it is Q equilibrium plus a small number epsilon which is the amplitude of the small motion times Q tilde of T. So what I'm doing, I am perturbing a little bit the equilibrium. How? With a small superimposed motion. Uh, uh, if you read the book of Arnold, you can find the rigorous version of this reasoning there. Okay, with all uh, upper bounds uh, calculated in, in the right way. Okay? No, ordinary differential equations. But what we will do? We will write, we'll take this, we will place these equations inside here. And we will neglect every term in which you have epsilon square. And we keep only the terms in which you have epsilon. Now, you understand why we say that What we are doing is a linearization. So what I want to tell okay, to you is that only recently big computers are available so that you can solve with numerical methods ordinary differential equations very easily. The or, look, the, the beauty, the reason for which I like very much the theorem of Gursa uh, about uh, existence and uniqueness of ordinary differential equations, which we will uh, study also in other lectures, is the following. Gursa invented this method which is now used after more than 150 years for getting numerical solutions. Exactly that method. Uh, I'm sure that you studied many tricks. They were teaching you how to solve this ordinary differential equation, this other ordinary differential equation, each with a different trick. The tricks are not working all the time. You get some solutions sometimes. Gursa method is solving every Lipschitz ordinary differential equation. So you plug in in the computer and you get, in a reasonably small time, the plot of the solution for some initial data. Okay. Imagine what happened before computers. Now, you are rather uh, young. So, you are children of the epoch of high computing uh, machines. Okay. I am old enough for having worked with cards of paper with holes 
and you needed blocks of many, many papers, piece of papers like that, to feed a computer which was making calculations, reading the input like holes in a piece of paper. Just for telling you an idea. I was a student in theoretical physics in Napoli, where a building big like this had one floor dedicated to a computer, which was 10 to the minus 5 times less powerful than this iPhone 6. Okay? So this, you must understand what is happening. Why I'm telling you these things now? Imagine to be a poor mathematician or a poor engineer 40 years ago. Okay? And imagine that you want to design this building to resist against earthquakes. You know that in L'Aquila we must be very careful with earthquakes. Okay? What you will do? You will write a Lagrangian for this structure. You know that this Lagrangian cannot be solved. I mean, the Lagrange equations corresponding to this Lagrangian cannot be solved in the non-linear regime. There are no chances. So what you do? You try to build a building which is strong enough that when an earthquake arrives, it vibrates a little bit in the neighborhood of a stable configuration, and you try to study the linearized system, which is the particular case of Lagrange equations for small motions. And they could do these calculations by hand. So the linearization procedure is not, look there is a Greek word which I want to use now in English, they, call, they read this paradigm, which is a scandal, because this is a Greek, Greek word which has to be pronounced paradigm. Okay, so I usually say paradigm, which sounds very strange to me, and then I say you should read paradigm, paradigm. Linearization is not a paradigm of science. We are not linearizing because this is the rule. We linearize because we do not know how to do. For getting some solutions, we linearize. Okay? So I'm telling you what how looks like the Lagrange equations for small motions. I tell you that it was an important thing, but please don't feel obliged in future to linearize anything. Okay? Because linearization for your generation is not necessary. Okay? Okay, now let us calculate the first derivative of this. You get q dot equal q dot of a constant is zero, epsilon q tilde dot. Q double dot is equal epsilon q tilde double dot. Okay? Now, we replace, ah, uh, just, I repeat, equilibrium 
configuration QE if and only if du over dq calculated in QE is equal to zero. Equilibrium is equivalent to being stationary for the potential energy. If QE is a minimum for you, then we are sure that the, motion, the, the uh, equilibrium configuration is stable. So the motion remains close QE. Why this is so crucial now? I have written epsilon Q tilde T and I assume now I will assume in what follows that the norm of Q tilde of T is smaller or equal to 1. So I assume that I have a motion which remains in the epsilon neighborhood of my equilibrium configuration. This assumption is meaningful only if QE is a stable equilibrium configuration. Otherwise, this assumption is totally meaningless because the system will go very far from the equilibrium and it is not true that a term with epsilon square can be neglected when compared with a term with epsilon. Clear? So this is what, what we have to understand. First of all, uh, how to say, an historical reason obliged our ancestors to linearize. Because linear systems can be solved, you have Rousseau Capelli theorem. You know Rousseau Capelli theorem. Existence and uniqueness of solutions of linear systems. How you call it? The theorem of Rousseau Capelli, please. Engineers never they make strange faces. You know. You know, the rank of the complete matrix has to be equal to the rank of the matrix of coefficients for having a solution. So you, we have an algorithm for solving linear systems. Okay. So in general, we can solve linear systems making some calculations by hand. Of course, if you have one million unknowns, <laughs> you cannot calculate the determinant of a square matrix with one million rows and one million columns. Okay? But small linear systems you can think to solve. Non-linear systems nobody knows what to do. So the linearization is an historical demand. Now you can avoid to linearize your equations. Of course, it is better if you write your ordinary differential equations in a normal form and if you are sure that it is Lipschitz, because otherwise you could get strange, meaningless results. Okay? So, I repeat, I assume that QT, the motion I'm uh, studying, is Q equilibrium plus epsilon Q tilde of T. I assume that the norm of Q tilde is smaller or equal to 1 and that epsilon is small enough so that I can neglect higher powers of epsilon. Okay. Now what I do? I replace in this equation. So I start one piece after the other. du over dqi it is a function of q of t okay but q of t is like that 
and epsilon is small so I can write this like du over dq calculated in qe plus the second derivative of u with respect to q okay and what I, I have to do I have to consider q t minus q epsilon q e okay which is the increment of q and this increment is exactly epsilon q tilde okay so this is qi this is qi qh and this is qh okay but qe is equilibrium is an equilibrium configuration so this is zero not only QE is a minimum for you what is happening to the second derivative so called Hessian matrix of a function in its minimum the Hessian ma uh, uh, matrix which is symmetric is also definite positive Okay, so this matrix here, which is calculated in QE, is a definite positive symmetric matrix. Okay, so du over dqi is equal. To epsilon, an Hessian max matrix, cal and you calculate the row times column product with the Q tilde vector. Okay, so what we do? We replace these results in our Lagrange equation. So this, look at this one, oh, let, let me joke a little bit, uh, there is a, a Latin expression which is captatio benevolentiae, which means attracting your good feelings towards me. Okay, so I, I tell you that actually it is the first time, and I'm giving this lecture since nearly 20 times, that I arrive here and up to now there is no minus mistake in the equation. So probably this is due to the fact that you corrected me in the right moment. Or you did an even number. Or I did an even number and nobody discovered. Now, uh, what we will write now is a linear equation, because look, this term is replaced by the second derivative of u with respect to qi qh q tilde h epsilon will be factorized so will be uh, as a factor of, of all the expression then if I place here q dot I get epsilon here and epsilon here quadratic negligible ok so this I don't write plus a i h q double dot h equal zero this is 
the motion, the equation of small motions for every Lagrangian system in the neighborhood of any equilibrium stable configuration. Okay? In a matrix form, we can write this in this way. The matrix capital A, symmetric, definite positive, times the vector Q double dot, equal, uh, there is a tradition in mechanics to call the action of a potential energy in a stable equilibrium configuration, we call it the elasticity matrix or the stiffness matrix. Okay? Why? Because it tells you which is the tendency of the system to be recalled back to the equilibrium. Okay? And this is beautiful because you have minus K Q. Okay, the matrix A is calculated in QE and the matrix K, uh, K is calculated in QE. When Q is zero, there is no force. If K, Q is different from zero, you get always a positive force with minus sign because it tries to pull you back to zero. Okay, I of course forgot, uh, it is the typical, what Arnold is calling an abuse of notation, of course this is Q tilde there. Okay? Okay. Now, ah, look, this is not a theorem, tell me. I'm confused how you got from <laughs> look, this is QI, QH, Q tilde H. So when you make the summation, you are taking this matrix row times column, and you get this i equal 1, i equal 2, i equal n. So you have the matrix notation. This is the matrix, apply to a vector, you get a vector. i is the index of this vector. Okay? And the same is here. Okay? Okay, so I am afraid we must work a little bit on this notation because this is very important for understanding what we are doing. But you are familiar with this notation, right? With the matrix notation. Okay. Now, this is a, a look, uh, I can tell you a series of trivial things, but let us tell them. When you have y dot equal f of y, you know that there is a unique solution of this uh, uh, the French ordinary differential equation when f is Lipschitz continuous. Okay? But if f is of class C1, what can we say? There is roll theorem. The increment is always the derivative calculated somewhere in between the two. No? If you have f of y minus f of x, this is always equal to f prime of somewhere times y minus x. 
right? This is roll Lagrange theorem. So if a function is of class C1 in a given compact domain, its derivative is continuous, it has a maximum. So this is always smaller or equal to the maximum of the derivative times y minus x. Okay? So if a function is of class C1, then it is Lipschitz. Okay? So should we be should we be worried about existence and uniqueness of this problem? Of the solution of this problem? No. Because this is a C infinity function. It is a linear function. Okay? So we know that every initial problem, so Q tilde T0 equal Q0, and Q tilde dot T0 equal Q dot 0, every problem, initial data problem for this system of equations is well posed. There is a unique solution. Okay? Can we calculate it? There is an algorithm I will teach you and I will describe it to you. This algorithm is allowing us to find the solution of this problem. Okay? I will not prove a theorem which we need. And maybe somebody among you could decide to find it in, in the web and to make a presentation on this theorem. I'm, I'm giving you proposals, okay? Please start accepting some of them, okay? Ah, for going ahead, now I please ask you to tell me a what can be called a pitiful lie. Tell me that you know everything about eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Yeah, you know? Okay. You are, the Russians are, the Soviet, are <laughs> the only one who tell yes all the time. Okay, uh, we should be afraid of Soviet <laughs> education. Okay. So if you have troubles with eigenvectors and eigenvalues, tell me, I will tell you more details, okay? I want to write, I have this equation. I want to write it in a normal form, so I can easily multiply both times a to the minus 1. Okay, you know what is the inverse of a matrix, right? So I get that q double dot is equal to minus a to the minus 1 k q. Okay? Now let us make a, let us dream. Okay? Yeah? Is it enough previous assumption to see that a determinant of a is not equal to zero? No, the 
the A is much more than non-singular because it is definite positive. Definite. Okay. I mean, it is definite positive, strictly definite positive, so its determinant has to be different from zero. Actually, its determinant is positive. Okay? Okay, now what I want to tell you is a, a series of heuristic, heuristic reasonings Which kind of heuristic reasonings? Let us dream. I have, we can call this capital L. So I have the equation Q double dot equal minus capital L Q. Okay. And I want to solve this equation. So which kind of nice cues can exist? So, for instance, assume you have, assume you have a nice vector, I can call it Q bar, which has a very nice property, L applied to Q bar is equal a scalar lambda times Q bar. What is doing this nice Q bar vector? This Q bar vector is such that you take the complex matrix L, you calculate rho times column products and miracle you get a vector which is parallel to Q bar. Okay, these are dream vectors. Okay, vectors which we would like to meet for having our life easier. Why? I tell you why. I try to find the solution QT like a function of T, a scalar function of T, times Q bar, which is a complicated vector. What happens? Q double dot is equal to F double dot times Q bar because Q bar is independent of time. This is equal to minus L Q which is minus L F of T Q bar. F of T goes out You have the minus here, L of Q bar is lambda Q bar. Okay? So, if you have this dream vector, what you have? F double dot Q bar equal minus F of T lambda Q bar. Okay, now you have two possibilities. Either Q bar is the null vector, and then as zero multiplied everything is always equal to zero, you are lost. This equation, if Q bar is the null vector, this equation is not telling you anything. Okay? Ah, by the way, just for continuing to tell you some jokes, today I don't know why, I'm a little bit sad, so I'm not telling you many jokes. Uh, a delegation of students came to me several, maybe five years ago, and they told me, Professor, can you tell me in two words why you cannot divide times zero? 
Now this is a big problem for engineers, modern engineers. So I told them, look, zero times two is equal zero. Zero times three is equal zero. Zero times every number is equal to zero. Okay. How can multiply zero times a number and get one? It is not possible. For this reason, you cannot write one divided zero. Because there is no number which multiplied times zero gives you one. I don't understand. You must tell me in two words. I said, sorry. You cannot divide times zero. Five words. Less than this, I cannot do. Now, why this is true in this context? I have a number multiplied a non-vanishing vector, which is equal to a number multiplied a non-vanishing vector. So I can write f double dot plus lambda f times q bar equal zero. Q bar we assume is a non-vanishing vector. The only possibility is that this scalar is zero. Okay. I understand the motivation behind this. Why did we do all this? Uh, I want to find f of t. I w the motivation, this is an heuristic reasoning. I must conclude it. This is an heuristic reasoning for telling you that if I have an eigenvector of L, then I have a solution of this ordinary differential equation. And I'm trying to build this. Okay. So at the end of the story, what I have proven? If I solve the harmonic equation of motion, so because this is you recognize this is the harmonic equation of motion, then for every eigenvector non-vanishing, I have a solution of my problem. Because Q of T equal F of T times Q bar is a solution of this equation. So what I am teaching you is this. Give me, give me all eigenvectors and all eigenvalues of the matrix L. For each eigenvector, I can construct a solution of this ordinary differential equation. Okay? So now next problem is how many eigenvectors independent eigenvectors exist for a given matrix L? This is the next step. And here I prefer not to go into the details of a theorem which could require us one hour of discussion and technically it's not my business to do it because I'm teaching you some mechanics, not linear algebra. However, it could be very good for you if you go and read a demonstration of this theorem and if somebody among you wants to discuss this demonstration, which by the way is constructive, so 
it helps also to find the solutions. Uh, uh, this could be a very nice uh, presentation for the final exam. Do you remember how we built L? We have built L in this way. L is A minus 1 K. So it is the product of the inverse of a definite positive matrix times another definite positive matrix. Both of them, A and K, are symmetric. Okay? There is a nice theorem in linear algebra. Every matrix L built in this way has exactly n independent eigenvectors. Okay? So why having exactly n independent eigenvectors is so good? Consider the eigenvector P1, P2, Pn and then the eigenvector P1, P2, Pn. Okay, so we have a, an n times n matrix. Okay, <coughs> each eigenvector has n components. We have n eigenvectors, so we can order the eigenvector in columns and in rows building one matrix and another matrix, one being the transpose of the other one. Okay? Now, what happens if I call Q the matrix n times n, which is built with eigen vectors, okay. I can tell you that this matrix is orthogonal. The transposed times the matrix is equal to the identity. Why? Look, here I am running, I repeat you, my philosophy is that this is linear algebra, so you should know already it, but if you don't know, please go to read this stuff, because maybe you survive to this class, but to this course, but you will never survive as a mathematician if you do not know what is an eigenvector and an eigenvalue. And if you don't know that the n independent eigenvectors are pairwise orthogonal, and that you can choose all these n eigenvectors in such a way that each of them is long one. So you can form an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. So when building the matrix Q with these eigenvectors, this matrix is orthogonal. Okay? But what is beautiful is also this other stuff. Q transposed L Q is equal to a diagonal matrix. And the elements of the diagonal matrix are the eigenvalues. Now, why 
I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this because we started with the equation Q double dot equal minus LQ. Okay? <coughs> so, what I, I want to do? I place Q Xi equal small Q. So I'm changing the variables. I'm changing the Lagrangian coordinates. You know, this equation means Q1 Q2, Qn equal the matrix Q, capital Q, Xi1, Xi2, Xi n. Okay? So what I'm doing? Instead of using the Lagrange coordinates Q, I equivalently I'm introducing the coordinates Xi. Okay? This is what I'm doing. Ah, let us stop one moment. If you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between a set of coordinates and another set of coordinates, there is no reason for which you prefer the first to the second or the second to the first. If there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between two sets of coordinates, you can decide to use one or the other. Okay? So, we started with Qs. Okay, but now we can introduce size in order to have a better representation of our problem. Why not? Okay. So what what can I do? I replace because Q is equal to Q Xi. So, here I place Q Xi. Okay. Then I calculate Q double dot, which is Q Xi double dot because Q is time independent. So this equation is transformed into, into this one. Q Xi double dot. Okay? I multiply from the left with Q transposed and I get Xi double dot equal minus Q transposed L Q Xi. Because of my choice of Q, it is written here, I get Xi double dot equal minus lambda xi. Lambda is a diagonal matrix. So what I have? 
lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n, 0, 0, 0, everywhere 0. Xi 1, Xi 2, Xi n. Okay? So, Xi double dot 1 is equal first row column minus lambda 1 Xi 1. Psi double dot 2 is equal to minus lambda 2 psi 2. Psi double dot n is equal to minus lambda n psi n. Quod erat demonstrandum. What had to be proven? Okay. the motion in the neighborhood of a minimum of potential energy is the linear combination because remember Q is equal to Q transposed Xi so the motion Q of T is a linear combination of what? The solution of this, the solution of this, the solution of that. So I have n harmonic motions. I make the linear combination of these n harmonic motions and I get the generic small motion in the neighborhood of a minimum of energy. Okay, now let us stop a little bit to think what we have done and what it means. Okay? We have introduced a large class of physical system models, discrete models. Which large class we have introduced? The Lagrangian systems, minimizing Lagrange action, built in this way, potential energy function only on the space of configurations minus kinetic energy. So this is the assumptions we have done. Okay? Then we have found a minimum of potential energy. So Lyapunov condition tells us that this configuration is a stable equilibrium. If you perturb a little bit the system in the neighborhood of this stable equilibrium, the system will remain always inside this neighborhood. Okay? So, the assumption that Q of T is equal to Q equilibrium plus epsilon Q tilde of T is reasonable. Which are the equations for the small perturbation of our system? Take the matrix L. The matrix L we are building with the Hessian matrix of U and the matrix of kinetic energy. So it is known. You calculate these matrices in the configuration equilibrium, stable equilibrium. So this L is given. 
then solve the problem of eigenvalues and eigenvectors for this matrix. Okay? What is this? Linear algebra. Okay? Maybe we can tell you quickly if we have time. Yes, we will have time, so we'll tell the algorithm how to calculate these eigenvectors and these eigenvalues. Calculate these eigenvectors and eigen corresponding eigenvalues. Okay. With the eigenvectors, you can build the diagonalizing matrix Q. With the eigenvalues, you can write this N harmonic motion equations. Ah, by the way, you know that the square root of lambda is the pulsation, I don't know, the, the, is related to the frequency of this harmonic motion. So, an N degrees of freedom system has exactly N proper frequencies. Okay? These are called, with the German word, eigenfrequencies and eigenvalues corresponding. Okay. You calculate Q transposed Xi and you get the generic solution of your small vibration problem. Uh, how do you get initial data for Xi? is very simple. Xi zero is equal Q zero of, uh, sorry, Q of Q zero. You give the initial data for Q and you get initial data for Xi and obviously Xi dot zero is equal to Q, Q dot zero. Okay? So you have completely solved the problem of initial data for this linearized system. The one from which we started, which disappeared, and we will write once more. Q double dot equal minus L Q. What is very important, mathematicians should understand this. What is extremely important is the following. Every small motion is governed by this system of equations. So in a sense, this is a universal equation. And it can be applied to everything, actually. Okay. I don't know if, no, maybe not today. Did you hear talking about the resonance phenomena? Yes? So we will talk about this uh, phenomena uh, in one of the next lectures, always in the Lagrangian framework. Okay? Good. Now, maybe it is worth that we give you some hints about the... I hope it is useless and it is only a repetition for you, but... It is better if I give you these ideas, because <coughs> otherwise the, the, fra the general scheme, the general frame I'm telling you is not complete enough. L, Q, 
cube bar equal lambda cube bar. If you look at this equation, this is a strange equation. Because you have two unknowns, q bar and lambda. So the, this problem is, given the matrix L, you must find simultaneously the eigenvector q bar and the eigenvalue lambda such that this equality is verified. Okay. And so this is a rather difficult problem. However, Q bar has to be different from the zero vector. This is the extra condition which we impose. Why? Because a Q bar equal to zero is useless for finding our solutions. Okay? L Good, so you have that L Q bar minus lambda identity Q bar is equal to the zero vector. Okay? <coughs> uh, we know that rho times column product is not commutative. We are very careful, we must be very careful but we can factorize on the right here so you have L minus lambda identity applied to the vector Q bar equal to zero with Q different from zero okay now this now you need Rouché Capelli theorem. Uh, let us try not to quarrel. Capelli has been a professor in Napoli University. Okay, Rouchet is a French who did it, uh, who wrote a partial result. It was Capelli who has proven this theorem. Okay, so like I will not tell you that Lyapunov is not good, you should not tell me that Capelli is bad. Okay. The theorem of Rouché Capelli tells you that a matrix of coefficients gives you a homogeneous system with non vanishing solutions only if the rank of the matrix of coefficients is not maximum. Because if the rank is maximum, you have only vanishing solutions. You agree with this or not? Yes. Uh, you are all mathematicians here. Okay? So the determinant of the matrix of, of coefficients has to be zero. So the equation for finding the eigenvalues of why I wrote a L the, the equation for finding the eigenvalues of L is this one uh, do you know who wrote this equation in some particular case the first Gauss and do you know why he wrote this equation? it is related to the first problem I told you the problem of n bodies so it is better of course to, to describe you the calculations and this part of uh, uh, mechanics could require hours but you have now enough knowledge I hope to at least understand what uh, Gauss was doing Gauss assumed that 
a first approximation of the motion of the planets around the sun was the solution of a two-body problem. The sun in the middle and the planet moving around. Okay? And I don't know, I hope that you have studied this problem. Kepler laws, trajectories of planets are uh, conical sections, so either parabolas or hyperbolas or ellipses. <coughs> the area velocity is constant, okay, and there is a proportionality between the period of motion and the axis of the ellipses with some cubes. So, you have this solution in a completely closed form. If you try to study the motion of the Sun, the Earth and the Moon, a three-body problem, you are lost. There is no closed form solution. If you want to study the influence of Mars on the motion of Earth, there is no closed form solution. <coughs> so what Gauss imagined? He wrote the equation of gravitational force with imagining that Mars had a mass distributed along its trajectory and he tried to calculate the gravitational influence of the motion of Mars on the motion of Earth using this approximation. While solving this problem, he needed to find an eigenvalue. The square root of lambda in Gauss reasoning was the period of the perturbating motion imposed by a far planet on a close planet. For this historical reason, this equation is called secular equation because it allows us to calculate the secular perturbation in the motion of planets. Okay? So, as you can see, the theory of eigenvalues and eigenvector has been grown together with the theory of motions which are perturbed of a small amplitude far from another motion. Okay, so it is an old interconnection and the mathematics has been developed in order to solve these mechanical problems. You should not lose this connection. Okay, now which is the bad news? Uh, this equation is not very nice. It is very bad. <coughs> you have L11 minus lambda, L12, L1n. L21, L22 minus lambda, L, L, two, three, L, two, N, 
ln1 ln n minus lambda. Okay? Do you know how to calculate with Laplace rule the, this determinant? You have this times the determinant of that plus minus 1 to 1 plus 2 this times the complementary minor and so on ok are you surprised if I tell you that that L minus lambda identity is a polynomial of nth order in lambda you are not surprised so this is a polynomial of nth order in the variable lambda equals zero. This is a bad new. This is a very bad new. Why this is a bad new? Can you solve? a polynomial equation in closed form if n is more than 4? Not in all cases. Not in all cases. There is no general formula. This is uh, a famous theorem. Galois theorem. So you could feel very bad. I have an algorithm for solving a generic linear Lagrange equation, but when I try to get the corresponding eigenfrequencies of each harmonic motion, I find a problem which cannot be solved. And this is a big difficulty. It is a big difficulty. Not now. I think that a software which we are using, it is not even the best one available in the, in the market. Its name is MATLAB. Can easily solve a system of two millions of unknowns. And you ask them, ask him, uh, can you give me the first 300 eigenfrequencies? The first 2,000 eigenfrequencies? At the end of the story, they must write this polynomial and find the solutions with an approximate system, and the algorithm is with an approximate procedure, and the algorithm is very well established. So, in the epoch of big computing uh, tools, this is not so difficult. Okay? Do you remember I said you what is in general a metric space? Okay? Now, in order to go ahead in discussing the solution of the initial data problem for Lipschitz ordinary differential equations, we were left with the problem of discussing what it means distance between two functions. Now I want we have few minutes, okay. I want to underline, I hope you already know it, 
that there are different possible distances which can be found in general in every system and in, part, in every set and in particular in the set of functions defined in an interval. So let us consider the time interval T0 Tf. Okay? This is a function. Okay. I have the graph of another function and I call, so I have f and g. I call distance between f and g the maximum of the absolute value of f of t minus g of t in the time in the interval i which I am considering. This is called Lagrange distance. Okay. It verifies it verifies the axioms for distance which I gave you last time. Okay? Now, given, imagine this, I hope that you did, there are very nice, Kolmogorov <coughs> is another very nice book in which this reasoning is described. If you have a metric space, you can call ball or sphere of center one point and radius epsilon the set of all elements in your metric space such that their distance is smaller or equal to epsilon from the center. Which is the ball of center F and radius epsilon? Did you think ever about this? Consider the function which ob you obtain displacing the graph of, epsi of epsilon over 2. And consider the other graph of the function with epsilon over 2 below, with minus. So you consider f plus epsilon over 2 and f minus epsilon over 2. So what you have? You have a stripe. Okay? Every function whose graph is inside this stripe has a distance less than epsilon over 2. So this is the sphere of center f and radius epsilon over 2. Very nice geometry in the set of functions. Okay, now the algorithm I was giving you last time the limit of yn, which the sequence of yn which we were describing last time. This limit is calculated in this metric. Now I, I give you something to think. Please go Everybody said that he has read about metric spaces. Okay. Do you know what is a metric space, really? A metric space is where Cauchy sequences live. Are living. 
Okay, what I mean? What is a Cauchy sequence? A Cauchy sequence is a sequence such that for every epsilon you find an n big enough so that after that n all the elements of the sequences are in the ball of center xn and radius epsilon. Now, metric spaces are of two kinds. Complete metric spaces and not complete metric spaces. In complete metric spaces, every Cauchy sequence is converging and in incomplete spaces, some Cauchy sequences are not converging. The main argument in Gursa theorem is I have a sequence of functions which is a Cauchy, fun, a Cauchy sequence. How do I know it is converging? Because I need to have a metric space which is complete. So the main argument is this metric space is complete. Exactly like real numbers is a metric space which is complete. So the sequence which we are building for square root of 2 is converging somewhere. Okay?